Okay, thank you for a nice uh, introduction, and I, I don't have very much more to say. So, <laughs> but um, and also it's it's nice to be here. I I guess um, um, I expect that most people here are from uh, kind of architecture environment, uh, and I'm not an architect, but I guess I belong to this kind of neighboring discipline in a way um, of um, of contemporary art, which is also digesting different kind of cultural phenomena as, as architecture is, but. Um, I and like has been mentioned, I've been quite uh, quite interested in in architecture in one way, um, not so much for the buildings and so on, but more for um, the kind of environments that are created or how uh, buildings um, are part of a certain time, part part of a certain economy, uh, part of a kind of sociological process at a given time. So it's kind of describing movements in society at the moment, but also might describe kind of historical movements um, as a kind of testimony to those. And um, as, an, as an artist, I've moved between many different um, um, work methods in a way. I, I uh, work with photography and, uh, and video, uh, like I have worked with the performance-oriented videos, video installations, and also film or narrative film. And then uh, architectural installations, and also uh, sometimes pieces uh, that have been uh, kind of more temporary in the streets, like uh, I've done uh, graffiti works, and I've also done installations that are up for uh, just a, um, a short period of time. I mean, also exhibitions, are, of course, also certain of just for a short time, but something that occurs in the, in the, in the street, on the square, or something. Um, and. Um, and also the radio plays are a way to kind of insert uh, works into uh, a kind of everyday narrative of a city in a way, where you do, don't just meet um, the art um, audience, but the art audience as well as just kind of people that more accidentally meets the works. And over the last 10 years, uh, the focus has become more on kind of narrative films, and some people have been presenting that as a kind of new development in my work, but the kind of narrative aspect has been something that was there from the beginning, uh, I was writing uh, short stories and things before I started to do uh, artworks. And also the radio narratives and sound installations and so on of the 90s have a lot in common with the, with the later um, uh, kind of moving image works and so on. So, and um, my idea of, of space also in, in my, in my uh, in installations and so on have been primarily occupied with two, two things. I guess one thing is the kind of a place, a particular place. So it's a particular site that's kind of historic and has particular investments, not just a kind of formal category. And the other thing would be uh, a space that's uh, kind of uh, activated by, by the viewer and takes on the kind of narrative quality. Moving through the installations, you, you become part of a kind of dynamic with other viewers and so on. Um, so the, the kind of narrative element has been kind of consistent throughout. I'm going to start by showing a film. Uh, Oblique, I'm going to show some different works. I can't show all the kind of different works I've been doing, but I'm trying try to make a selection here that hopefully makes sense uh, in this context. And um, please interrupt me, and, um, and hopefully you have some questions afterwards. So I'm going to start now with a film from 2008, Oblique. It was first uh, presented for uh, Manifesta in um, an art biennial in, uh, in Italy. Uh, in 2008 as part of an installation that was open 24 hours um, of the day. I mean, it was open for many months, but it was uh, accessible at night as well as daytime and so on. So it became also uh, a space where people could come in the daytime and uh, it could be part of the kind of art audience uh, move through the city, but also where either art audience or the people that were sometimes were, were some um, youth having a party inside the installation and so on. It became part of the kind of city dynamic for a temporary period in a different way than if it was just in an, exhibi in an exhibition space. So, yeah, with all that said, I'm going to turn it on.
are you afraid of me? No. You should be. If I make up my mind to take you on, you will learn what fear is. I have powers that few others have ever mastered. What kind of powers? Mental powers. A force of will that can bend the physical world into any shape I want. Do you remember the blackout and the stock market crash? The last four. Precisely. I was the one that caused them. Approximately at five o'clock, I said to myself, I wish that the whole world had to live in the same darkness and pity as I do. In less than one hour, all the lights in the city were out. And in less than two, markets were crashing all over the place. What kind of powers do you have? Normal people power. Can I have this? Can I have a cucumber? Sure. Hmm. I think he's roughing it. This is the story. I came upon this woman. She was crouched down and silent. She spoke to me quietly. She appeared to be a mother. She said, it demands from you now. It demands that you come clean, that you manage not just to throw up all the things you imagine about others or what you think is wrong with others, but that you come out with the stories that are within yourself, the stories that motivate you in your assault on others. You've got to come clean, remember? Remember? I sit down on a late night train. She comes, slightly mid-eastern looking, chewing gum, curly hair, a slightly broad nose, many tiny teenage pimples on her skin. I catch her gaze from a distance. Seconds later, she asks in German if the seat across from me is free. She asks more questions about the time, very friendly. Around her neck sparkles a sturdy encrusted cross. Choose gum, reads book, text from phone. I open my eyes and she's gone. It's like losing money. There's something going on here. Some kind of something. Some kind of European something. Something. It's like rush hour without a job like looking into a fishbowl. The young man in the bad trousers begging for money, the older guy also begging for money, the dealing, the short change, the short escape, the song, the boundary, the gaze, the long gaze, the bent gaze, that is some looking. Too many bad buildings, too many good ones, too much collapse, too much restoration, Two persons talking about something, about anything. Words that are put to the test every day and that have a hard time surviving through the course of an everyday. You know, words that survive trying to find money every day. Words that survive trying to find affirmation every day. Words that survive trying to encounter love every day. Words that survive trying to see oneself in the world. 
not orphaned or displaced in the everyday. Words that have a hard time. What are you looking at? Hi. Can I sit? Sure. All these things that come out of me. I'd rather not think about it. Have you heard about the plane crash today? Yes. I don't want to know. You have to hear about this. This is very serious. Yes. But I don't want to hear. 160 people are dead. Half of them are children. I told you not to tell me. I admire you for that. Take people sitting around the table playing cards and stealing liquid is spilled, napkins, difficult to have control, falls asleep, train moving, close ups, etc. One gets up, leaves, walks corridors, loses something on the floor, attempts to get it up, get it back. Active. Camera pans around. R or M get up. Moves down corridor. Take the eye drops again. Attraction. Get back. Play cards. Income. I have to get friends. I have to get food. I have to pay for life. I have to pay for others. I have to pay for life. For life. Seduction. Balance. Emptiness. A suspension of time or being left in space, left in time, left in language. Outgo. Expenditure. Excess. Language. Generosity. Speech. Violence. Acting out seduction. Receive. Interpretation. To understand. But also to feed back. To accept. To hear also what you don't want to hear. Passive, apathy, acceptance, masochism, lack of interpretation, lack of care, dissolvement. Yield, it's time to yield, time to let go, time to not be in the way, but also to abandon a project. Who sings that song? Who sings that boundary? How do you sing the boundary? It is like a song sung by you, by somebody. Not me this time. So, um, one thing, because it's, uh, I guess, a while ago since uh, I made the work and often you know, forget things, but. It was a little bit uh, inspired by, um, by uh, some things that were going on at that time in, in 2008. And, and um, one thing was, of course, it was just when the kind of uh, financial collapse was starting to spread outside the States. 
And, um, but it was also a lot of talk about nationalism in, in, in Europe and so on, and there was a lot of, um, you know, all, uh, I often felt that the kind of discussion on, on, uh, on migration in, uh, in Europe is uh, really kind of history-less in a way. And uh, in many of my works, I've I tried to deal with that more in, in, the, um, in the background, maybe not so apparent in this work as in later works like Abyss and so on. Basically, to deal with it as a kind of historic phenomena, all of, of Europe's history is a history of, of movement of different peoples and, uh, and uh, kind of uh, customs and cultures and so on. It stretches throughout the en uh, entire history. It's also part how the different kind of uh, cultural centers and so on have been uh, created, but not just that. Also, in terms of you know, kind of agricultural habits or what have you, language, slang, and things like this. Um, so it's been important for me to to present uh, uh, an environment that's historically um, uh, layered in that way, and I can do that visually, of course, by photographing environments that have like lots of different kind of historical elements in it, and that also are uh, marked by uh, kind of movements of habits and so on to do with movements of people in, in around in Europe. But it was specifically this idea of borders, and I was just interested in shooting, well, it was a text and also was, was uh, actually it was um, talking about uh, the borders and how people upkept borders and so on. And, uh, and I became interested in presenting um, a kind of Europe in the background. That is a kind of European transition. And uh, it was shot in Lithuania, uh, but it could have been shot other places in, in mid-Europe. And what you see outside the train is a kind of changing um, kind of, uh, yeah, um, landscape on the kind of edge of cities, kind of just between cities, with uh, kind of old buildings, new buildings, uh, uh, collapsing buildings, uh, kind of uh, erection of buildings, uh, you know, uh, renewal and, and uh, kind of a collapse. And um, so that's the kind of background. And then the whole, whole film was shot, shot inside this train also with a kind of it's like kind of mixture of people and and uh, and uh, characters like in many of my films well not necessarily characters but the actors were speaking english in different ways so uh so you can say that english is kind of currency but it's spoken and broken in different ways uh, to do with that people actually you know have uh, have different backgrounds and so on and um and apart from that i was also just trying to be very loose with the form and trying to Make one thing was just work with the with the background, which is then the urban environment and and so on, and then uh, but have a more um, kind of psychological narrative that's not attempting to be a realistic or anything like this, but moves between describing kind of everyday occurrence or material detail to going in a kind of um, psychological or slightly animalistic uh, uh, spirit where the um, where the kind of, yeah, I don't know, where the, the border between a, a person or subjectivity and space is kind of uh, more dynamic or broken down. So, um, and uh, I can show you in a minute how it was installed. For this in, uh, in Manifesta, I developed uh, an installation together with the Norwegian architect, Siri Jäger Bruvik. Okay, here you see from the front. So it's about, it's about three meters tall and uh, 17 or 18 meters long, and you can enter the space from two different uh, sides, either from, from the front side where you kind of basically looked into this kind of first space of the installation. So you have to imagine that this is quite large. Huh? And, uh, or uh, if you came from the other side, uh, basically you, uh, you face the back of it and then just like this long fence wall. So, the piece kind of functioned as a kind of fence itself. And of course, it's not the kind of fence you would have around an, uh, a house, or, I mean, a kind of, you know, somebody's uh, home or something like this, but it's a kind of fencing that the, the company that built it, they built this around, um, you know, corporate storage areas or sports grounds and stuff like that. So it was also a kind of demarcation of the space and making the, um, making the, the viewer kind of active in relation to the to um, to the piece by demarcating uh, his or her body, you know. So you actually you have to physically move around this, and you can see where you're going. But but the space is defined for you anyway, and you can't reach it without walking around. And um, um, yeah. And then the, the second space inside is like a double um, chain link fence uh, space, 
bit vegetation, this kind of overgrowth you might find uh, around fences. But here it's kind of a double thing. It makes a kind of um, um, slight reduction of, of light, and it helps in the acoustics because inside I have uh, I have the film. So and there's also this kind of construction cloth that's used uh, in constructions, at least in Italy, both in construction sites and in in um, uh, kind of gardens and things like this, uh, which together with the plants create this kind of more like kind of uh, fishbowl-like space. So it's the sense of that um, that light can move through it. It's not like a total black box, which films are often shown in. Um, but it's still dark enough just so that it works to show the film. And uh, yeah, and there's a bench inside and so on. This installation is very um, kind of utilitarian. It's very loose, and it's kind of allusions to whatever kind of sociological aspect would be, like you know, just this kind of domination of space or kind of possible kind of violent, violent uh, definition relation to the body. Uh, but it, it comes out of a, a series of um, of installations that were maybe more um, more uh, specific in that way um, from the 90s. And um, this is a, a piece of first time it was shown in Momentum in Moss, and then it was shown the uh, white columns in New York, and then in different other variations, other places. But um, at that time, I was very interested in, in the spaces within the city, which uh, uh, with spaces, spaces of uh, deviation or crisis, so uh, uh, spaces for, for um, subjects of uh, deviation or crisis in relation to society. So um, kind of semi-open spaces which you had to fulfill some kind of criteria to uh, get into, much aligned with kind of, uh, I guess, Foucault's ideas of heterotopias, which are well, these kind of spaces of deviation or crisis, kind of non-space, but not like a utopia that doesn't exist, but a kind of um, space that still with, uh, exists within, within society. Uh, so if you say, like, the, the utopia would be this kind of image in the mirror, this kind of impossible space that you can't get to, then uh, the heterotopia would be more the mirror itself, this thing that facilitates this kind of uh, reflection of society. And often then, these were spaces connected to uh, particular behavior that would be kind of uh, more on the kind of fringes of the, how the city represents itself in the everyday, so connected, say, to, to, um, to sexuality, for example, or... Uh, physical disability or more kind of extreme things, not necessarily um, uh, a liberating space, but it could also be that. So uh, this this was actually an installation that uh, sought both to be a kind of narrative piece uh, by how the persons uh, got involved in the space, and also facilitated um, nine uh, artist videos. In it, and the big in to get in there, you had to walk through this uh, 17 meter um, uh, corridor, a bit of kind of sci fi um, uh, quotation, and more as a kind of uh, a joke on kind of uh, modernist architecture, I guess. And then, but when you got in all the way in and rounded the corner, you got into this uh, kind of system of uh, uh, dark viewing booths. Uh, from the kind of conventions of uh, of sex clubs or well, also maybe even nightclubs, and of course those conventions, uh, why they why they work, why they are dark, is this thing that on one hand you uh, you're not so visible, uh, so clearly visible, and you gain some freedom from that, and and but the other thing is also uh, you become kind of part of a you get get more blank in relation to other people in the space, so you become a kind of surface for people to project their desire onto. Um, but of course, also a dark space is a kind of comfortable space to watch uh, films. So these were then uh, uh, th in three kind of interlocked um, uh, viewing booths with kind of large mattresses and stuff. There were also these glass partitions. Uh, kind of, if you imagine that this person you see there, you see through a kind of dark glass partition. So you're in one space and you can see the other person or you can see the, uh, the video that the other person is looking at. Or you can just hang out there with some people. Or you can go to another space and see another film, and uh, and it was also one large kind of uh, more like a cinema space. 
And going back out again, there's also this trick on the light, which was basically when you entered it, you looked into a kind of diminishing light, a kind of reduction of light level through the corridor, and, uh, and the effect was more to look towards the kind of dark but uh, uh, warm light. Coming back, going the other way, uh, you looked out towards the natural light, and so it was a much uh, cooler, cooler light. And um, in, um, I haven't shown this work for a while, but I hope it's, uh, I thought it would, this would be a good, uh, good occasion. And then for, um, for the Venice Biennial in 1999, in I um, kind of developed this uh, a bit further into uh, the first of a, of a series of uh, installations entitled The Care of the Self. And um, there, the kind of quotation, I'm sorry if it's, a bit, it's really difficult to, to see, I'm sorry, but we weren't able to adjust the, the screens together very well. But, Basically, what you're seeing is a kind of quotation of a nighttime park. So, I, uh, in Venice, within the Nordic Pavilion, I created um, also the whole exhibition architecture with two pavilions within the space. Uh, it's in the glass uh, pavilions, one for Ayelisa Attila, she needed to project the films, and then one for me for my nighttime park. And uh, so, it's a nighttime park, it's full of live vegetation, like trees, bushes, flowers, and grass on the ground, and, and paths. And, some more secluded areas uh, that you had kind of almost had, you had to find, or some more obvious areas where you walked in immediately, and uh, and uh, everything was on the kind of reverse uh, um, a time cycle. Like uh, basically, when you entered in in the opening hours of the exhibition, uh, it was uh, dark, so it was like a nighttime. The only light that you got in there was the light through the glass walls, which had this um, filter foil on them. Uh, so it was very kind of dimly lit space, and um, and uh, it took some time before the eyes adjusted. And of course, it's this idea of it's not really it's not about uh, nature, as in my opinion, as like some of the Norwegian critics went there and they talked about nature. But uh, for me, it was more this uh, this quotation from the, from the city, the city park, which is more about the way the kind of eroticization of of the city itself. It's uh, one. On one hand, just a kind of sociological space. It's like where behavior that can't happen in the daytime in the park, like where when the when the kids play around and when the kind of city is, is showing itself kind of public happens. But it's more the space of uh, where um, sexual cruising, uh, drug trafficking, or just like a hangout for teenagers or, or loners or whatever, or people want to be withdraw from the city. All these things can happen. But because of that, uh, it's also a kind of space. Um, or a place that's part of the kind of fantasy of the city, or this kind of uh, narrative or fantasy of the city that it, people might not have um, experience from, but it's part it's part of the yeah, city dynamic all the time until you know the morning comes, uh, is light, and the cleanup crews are kind of going around picking up the cra uh, trash, and it's uh, again part of just you know another uh, another cycle of the economy of the city. So that was a lot of talk on one one image, <laughs> the window. Of course, um, this this is in Venice. So at, at night time, when it was really the night time there, and of course many of you know the Gardinis in in, uh, in Venice, um, which are not really open like a public uh, park, but it's the only kind of real park in that area of Venice, maybe in all of Venice, and and it has just some kind of low fences. So when I was putting up the piece, I also saw that that park had this kind of life like other parks had uh, at night time, and then of course all these grow lights went on in the in the in the ceiling in my piece to keep the vegetation alive, and uh, and because of because there's so little light outside, then of course you could then you could look inside, which you couldn't do in the daytime, and it was just a kind of sculptural piece or visual piece, I guess, uh, for uh, for whoever was walking the park at night. Um, however, as I was working more with the with the um, with narrative through films and so on again, and uh, I kept making these installations and having separate rooms with, with the films. Uh, I thought that maybe this, uh, this, uh, sorry, this moment, that I didn't need to, to use this in such a kind of uh, literal way that the quotation didn't have to be so kind of one to one in a way, and uh, also that I became more interested in working with the kind of um, yeah, narrative uh, aspects of the, of the exhibition space in that way. And uh, 
So I joined the films uh, in with the installation. So, uh, so you would walk through different paths and so on, and one place you might come to a square, you might just sense the film uh, and uh, different paths. You could go somewhere else and sit on a bench or something. Um, and then you come into a square where, with some benches and so on, which, uh, where you could see the film. So it's again, I guess, a kind of quotation from, from the city, but it also really functional space for seeing the films because the, the, the vegetation um, broke down echo and so on in, in the architecture. Uh, and um, yeah, and created a kind of a good situation for the audio and, and, the, and the film. Yeah, in the in uh, around 2000, um, I was invited by the Tate in London to uh, to do an, to do an exhibition, and uh, I made a series of photographs, uh, 22 photographs from different uh, Western cities. Uh, so Europe and, and the US, um, and it was all like apartment buildings from the uh, very end of the 40s until the beginning of the 90s. And in a little bit similar manner to, uh, to this, uh, no, I guess I just, it's a kind of light cutting the top there, but anyway. In a bit similar manner to this uh, installations of the nighttime parks. Uh, what I tried to play on here, one thing I, I, I tried to not make this some kind of, um, um, you know, documentary project and so on. So I photographed everything at night time to make the, the building still like recognizable enough so you could kind of uh, uh, identify the, the structures or the kind of um, amount of, uh, of repair or disrepair and so on. I don't know how much you see in the back there because there's a, there's a kind of top light going on here. but. Uh, basically, this building is not really finished, and so on. So, some you know, some of the balconies are on, some are not, and so on. And some of these buildings have like uh, peeling paint, some have not, and so on. Um, but uh, there, there are really a mixture of um, of social housing and exclusive buildings. And from these pictures, it's not really a way to identify one thing uh, or the other. So it's it's left more to one's projections of like what these what these sites are within the city, like, you know, from either our experience or lack of experience, uh, knowledge or, or prejudices in relation to this uh, kind of architecture. Um, so, and I used to, I mean, it, it of course, it looks uh, terrible now in the video projection, but uh, they, they do have different colors uh, just um, from the light that's there, because, you know, this is in London, it, some of these pictures were from London, like this one. Um, there was this kind of mixture between the artificial light and the kind of slight uh, ambient light in the sky and then clouds and stuff that made things kind of soupy gray or so. Um, yeah. But I was also interested in just this uh, difference between this kind of architectural fantasy, I guess, you know, almost seeing these buildings as models and many of them are very sci-fi, light from the outside and very exciting, but of course the the kind of actual apartments in some of them, I, because I lived in a couple of these buildings myself, and they are just very mundane, uh, <laughs> not, not non-fantastic uh, apartments. So it's such a kind of big discrepancy between the kind of kind of outside and the, and the inside in a way. This is from uh, last year, and uh, so it was, uh, it's 2010, and it was in Bergen uh, Kunsthal. I did a show there where I had this one large installation going through uh, three of the main exhibition spaces there, with two films within them, and also uh, another installation by itself, uh, a kind of archival installation, and the uh, last uh, room with, uh, with photographs, from actually from a project in Grudu, so I might show those photos afterwards since there's some talk of uh, Grudu event uh, next, uh, next week. But first you would come into a kind of empty, uh, empty space uh, with just the two layers of fencing um, and, uh, and these lights, these kind of uh, spots more that are directed towards the area where you would enter as a, as a viewer. So it was a way, place where you just kind of become aware, I guess, of like physically moving through the space and by implication uh, your, your kind of body in the space. Um, but it was also to play on kind of optics uh, by, 
because the whole installation had this kind of axis of, uh, of visibility. Um, when you come into that space, which was the middle space, you could look through into one large space where you saw the back side of a back projection screen uh, through a fence. And the other way, you could see another uh, another screen going other way. So all this kind of side axis, and of course, it was much to do with uh, with um, with these films that dealt with the different urban space and so on. So, so um, I thought this kind of uh, to have this kind of optical uh, element in the film was quite nice. And then also this other thing that uh, to underline because of this chain link fence is obviously this uh, connection to. To you know, fenced off areas in the city, either for you know things that we're co quite comfortable with, like you know sports grounds and so on, or like uh, um, big uh, storage areas, corporate areas, and so on, and uh, or other other illusions we might have. This was a kind of temporary setup with strips and stuff, but it's um, but it's also something that makes you aware of of moving because you get this kind of um, 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 yeah movements of this uh, of the shadows and so on. And, and the different layers of the fences moving, and I'm quite interested in this kind of ideas of um, of parallax, and that's really a more a kind of psychological concept, uh, um, which um, you might may know Chisek has used in relation to architecture, and it's this idea that when when you move a kind of parallax effect, when you move in relation to another object, it's not that you just kind of see it from another side, but it's really that both you and this object change, and. Um, and uh, the reason why he can say that, of course, is within kind of psychoanalytical terms, you understand these things uh, linguistically and so on. And uh, because you see something from a different angle, also means that it's it's, uh, it's it's functioning differently. It's saying something different, and so on. And, and so are you. And uh, they extend this to this uh, idea of destabilizing uh, you as a subject. So. This kind of movement in relation to something else and, and, and experiencing that that change is also a way where your subjectivity is kind of floating. So that was a we'll talk about that. But um, so and if you want, walked um, in and into the one space, unfortunately this turned re up really dark on uh, on the screen. Have you adjusted the? Where is she? Okay. Anyway, we will. You might not see it from Russia, but uh, so there's uh, there's this different this um, fence space, and it also reaches different heights and so on in relation to the architecture. And first, you come into this kind of negative space of the projection, so you're seeing the film from the back. And many people just came into that space; it was quite large, and maybe sat through the whole film on that side. But very close to the entrance, there were these two openings on the side, so you could actually um, move, yeah, move uh, along. Along the wall and uh, and um, into no sorry well into the kind of you know I can't even say I guess that's the the positive so then you would be quite deep into the space so you're quite far back so it's it's um, it's working with 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 the space through these kind of architectural elements but it's also to create a space which is good for viewing the film. Because you're not just inside the the, uh, the door entrance, so it's easy to just step in and out. But you're quite far into the space, and I had cr constructed this um, kind of cement uh, seating, uh, well, which you can't see at all. Sorry. Um, so, there's somebody here who's going to help me with the light on the projector. Is she still here? Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. So it's it's like a it's it's a large concrete area in different levels, and it ends in <laughs> it ends in a, in a big fence wall with vegetation kind of overgrown again. Um, sorry, you can't see. Um, <coughs> and then if you went through the other space, out through that whole uh, whole uh, whole way again, you get into another. No, no. I cannot do it myself. It's impossible to see this stuff. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, man. Um, yeah. So you get, get came into another space. It was also a bit of kind of containing the flow of of people. And then this one had a large corner area, which was more akin to the stuff you'd find in a kind of uh, ballpark area in the city and so on. And it showed another film. It had another kind of. Uh, uh, Concrete area for 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 sitting, and um, and then this uh, 
project this, uh, this screen. So in this, um, actually in this, um, in the work with one of the films, I, I went through something like uh, three and a half thousand images to study a kind of representation of, um, um, it started with studying the representation of migration photographically. Uh, and. Um, just to think about how we would uh, deal with that in the film without necessarily somebody saying something about it, but just like in the layers of the film. And um, in the end it became, it kind of took on its own life and it became maybe more a kind of project about uh, kind of change and adoption and so on. And some, uh, some images are quite kind of obvious, they're kind of dramatic. You see somebody with a, with a machine gun next to somebody reading a, a book on the kind of, a, on the metro train or something like this. But some others are more uh, more subtle and so on, but about kind of just kind of yeah processes in society. So um, I hope you can see. I don't know. Just go through them. So is anything from kind of, yeah, I don't know, uh, buildings in trans uh, transition to uh, people in kind of, um, uh, either in like kind of extreme possibilities of, of, uh, of identity stuff or just in very kind of everyday situations or a kind of conflation of the, of the, of the two, I guess. And some are very humorous and some are very uh, serious. But, um, And here you can actually see through this axis into the other, um, other, uh, other installations. Last year, as, as was mentioned uh, earlier, um, I, I made two films, and um, it's um, it shot also in an environment that's clearly changing. Well, actually, all those studies on. On kind of representation of of, uh, of migration and then uh, change and so on photographically was really made, meant for that film and also constructed some of the scenes um, and um, it's shot in East London and partly also in the area that's changed by the Olympics but that's not the only area that's changing it's also shot in some markets and so on which are some of them don't exist anymore after we we shot and so on so it's but it's uh, also in the other shots is uh, what was of course so good about shooting somewhere like London is that you have all those kind of traces of changes in, in society uh, through time. And um, um, so you have, you know, um, like a Huguenot building next to like a totally new bank building or something like this. And the whole, the whole city has all those kind of uh, layers around and kind of traces of different kind of um, social movements, but also different economic movements, you know, kind of boom times of depressions and so on are, are so visible. Uh, so we worked a lot on the kind of environment in, in those pieces, as much as also, of course, the, the acting and the dialogues and so on. Um, but, uh, and we tried to position the camera in a way that it was kind of moving uh, a bit, um, yeah, not like, not like it would be moving as if, as if it's like witnessing something like another character, but more uh, akin to the space, like something that's more, more tied to, um, to, yeah, to the place and to the architecture and so on. Um, and um, then I made this other film, uh, Tripoli, which I'm showing you now, and that's not Tripoli uh, Libya, which you hear a lot about now, but it's Tripoli Lebanon, in northern Lebanon. And uh, since many of you are architects, you'll know about the Oscar Niemeyer's uh, project there, which was started in, in, um, in the 60s, and it was going to be this big uh, kind of uh, fairground, uh, kind of trade show area. And it was started when, uh, when Lebanon was this kind of success story in the Middle East, and of course, the, the civil war came in '75, and and uh, the, the work wasn't completed, so it's just been uh, left incompleted, um, and will probably never be completed because of the cost of kind of fixing up those structures now that are deteriorating. But it's also um, more than that. It's uh, it's uh, this kind of um, 
it's, it's not also open to the public now. It's open sometimes a little bit, but quite controlled. Uh, and it's um, and um, but it's it's most of its history is basically uh, through military use in in the civil war and also afterwards it's been used as uh, ammunition storage, landing uh, place for for um, helicopters, etc., and other military use. We worked with a, an, an uh, officer, a uh, former officer from the the Nis Army, on the piece and got, got to know a lot about the kind of stories there. So it's it's this really. Um, yeah, it's so intricate, intricately uh, tied to not only the country's history, but this kind of uh, ambivalent history of of, um, of violence and ideology. So it was a very difficult, um, very difficult piece to uh, to shoot in a way because um, uh, what to do with that, what to do with, with such a site, and uh, I also didn't want to make. Just a kind of uh, architectural docu documentary, and let the kind of architecture determine too much. But of course, it's, it's almost impossible it didn't sneak into the to the pictures. So I guess it became something like a combination between architectural uh, documentary and uh, and um, kind of schizoid uh, melodrama. That's t just of totally incomplete uh, sequences.
We should use the other foot next time. Oh, your head. Let you admit the ball. I want to see some cells scattered all over the place. Why not? Okay. I don't want to see you sweating only. I want to see some metal sacrifice as well. I'm kidding. Because if you look around you, kicking won't do. All right. I suggest you take the ball next time. Yeah. Did you see that thing you know by the bush? It's kind of odd, huh? Oh, yeah. You know what it is? I mean, what was that? You want mine? No, thanks. Do you want mine? <laughs> no, thanks. What's the first thing you notice in the place? It's not because it has nice curves or great proportions. It's if there are people in it or not. If you go in an empty restaurant, you don't think if it's beautiful or not. You think if it's safe to eat there, right? Or walking down the street at night. Even if the place is beautiful and nice, it takes a lot of meanings if there are people or not, and what kind of people. So this place is like that. Like a shell. Caught between meaningless and meaningful. A half full and half empty kind of place. What were you looking for? To cut our finger? Garbage? A limb? I think we should leave this place. It's like something that speaks saying, go away. I mean, something says, go away, I'll go away. And you expect me to go and come around with you to look for lumps of soil and holes in the ground? There are memories in this place that are not for you, so leave them alone.
told you it's cruel. It's all gone. That is based on false belief. No. Belief is fine. I know who I am. You should take a look upstairs. It gives you a different sense of scale about who you are. And leave you down here. I don't care about the view. It's just like a picture. Things seeming pretty because they're far away. I like the feeling of my body up there instead. The feeling of doing something wrong. Every footstep being wrong. Doing something I'm not meant to do or like. I like the feeling of being unnatural. It places me. Yeah, you like cruelty. You like to frighten yourself. That's what I thought. That's my camera. It's like being caught up with the older boys. You don't realize they have nothing to offer you. The only valuable is imaginary. Not like real people. It's like that bird. Now it's here. Now it's gone.
You freak me out. When he is here, you are well, not sick. And when he is not here, you are sick. I don't get it. When we're alone, you're always sick, and with him, you're not. Why? No, I'm exhausted, really. I have nothing more to give you. You know, it's not just down to you. If I'm sick, it's my body. It's your reality, it's where you go. I think it's time you start to think about why you were here. Why you scare yourself. So what do you say? It's time for you to give me something more. And that's up to you. It's your space. <laughs> your space, my space, same thing. But you need to move before it all catches up. Because you are high up with nothing underneath you. And it's a long way down. Do you understand? There's no one there to catch you. Do you know that?
All right. Thank you.